Judy. Judy, awesome. Hi, how are you? Good, actually, surprisingly. Um, Feeling better? Yeah, I'm, I, 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 yesterday I felt more like I had a stuffy head and cold, and I still have a little bit of a cough and stuff like that, but basically low-grade <laughs> symptoms. Um, and I'm almost sort of five days into the thing, so um, turning out as good a case as could be. And I was vaxxed all the way to bivalent vaccine, so I think that probably helped. And if there's silver linings anywhere, I understand that having caught COVID and gotten past it, plus vaccines is even better immunity from future cases. And I'm being told by several people that, hey, don't stop taking this thing seriously. You don't want to get COVID twice, um, which is real interesting. So yeah, so and sort of every time it attacks your system in, in funky ways and nobody's quite figured out what it's busy doing to us. Yeah, I know my uh, daughter and her fiance, he had COVID over Thanksgiving she and his mom tested negative, but now she has COVID and she doesn't know whether she picked it up from his rebound or picked it up from a conference that she attended and left early because she started feeling like she had a cold. Oh, that, that's probably it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's hard to know whether she picked where she picked it up. But it's, it's also it's really hard when you're around humans at an event, like humans are lovely and we just want to be with them. And it's so hard to keep distant and keep masked and keep everything. It's like it just breaks everything. She's been pretty it's careful, coffee, Kevin. She's a biology person, but anyway, it is what it is, but it's sort of affecting my humor because I don't know whether they were planning to come home for the holidays and I don't oh, know. Oh, I'm sorry. That. Someday I want to meet Blair. <laughs> she's a cool person. I've heard so many good stories about her. So. Um, cool. Nice to see everybody. I don't know whether Grace is going to be able to join us. Uh, she sometimes comes in in transport or whatever, but I'm going to hang out there for some of the things I wanted to say. Um, hey, Pete. Hey, Michael. Lovely to see everybody. Um, and, and actually, I'll, I'll start. I'll start by saying that I'm almost done watching last week's episode of this uh, hot series, the OGM Weekly Calls. Um, and I'm just blown away by how lovely last week's call was and wanted to, as, as first order of business, I just wanted to thank Grace from the bottom of my heart for stepping up to offer to host and for de doing such a brilliant job hosting, especially on such a different difficult topic. And for her holding a position, sort of not opposite, but different from the mainstream position in this crowd and doing it with Grace and aplomb and um and so forth so i just wanted to say um, and i'll repeat this if she comes into the room i just wanted to offer her my thanks because um i was just really moved by the call um and those of you many of you who are present right now were on the call so you you experienced it firsthand um i'm sorry i could be on the call but i think my absence was really useful to the call in ways that are of course unsettling to me but good for the call. So, hey, what the heck? Um, and then I wanted to say that I've got a poem I'd love to start this call with uh, by David White called Start Close In. <clears throat> so let me um, paste a link to the poem so you all can follow along if you'd like. Uh, and it's kind of, I think it's, I think it might be less relevant to uh, the topic than I thought it was when I remembered it. But I think it actually might still fit really well. So let me um, let me just read the poem to us. Um, and it goes like this. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in. The step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet, your own way to begin the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes an intimate, private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other 
for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing close in, the step you don't want to take. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Someone did turn on the closed captioning and I it's gone from my menu. Pete, was that you? I can't. Yeah, it's a weird out, thing. Participants I, can't figure out, I can't figure out where it went on my menu. Is it gone from hosts? Maybe. I guess. Um, so. So thank you for all those things. And then I wanted to briefly share screen and show my notes from the call from last week. Here's here's sort of the quotes and some of the connections that I took. And uh, I've, I'm kind of sort of ready to head in from someplace around there into this week's call. Um, let me share a link to this thought with everybody in the chat in case you wanna follow along. Um, um, and for anybody who was on last week's calls, I think a good place to start is any afterthoughts or reflections or things that have came into your mind afterward or comments you'd like to make now. Bueller, Bueller. Anyone? Did you like it, not like it? Stacy. Liked it. Thumbs up. I like it. The Roman Coliseum style. The gladiator lives. Um, Michael liked it. So cool. Let's let's keep going in then. Um, I I asked on the OGM list if anybody had a Miro space we might use to draw about this, and I haven't checked back. Uh, but last I looked, nobody had said. Here's a mirror space, but if anybody wants to put a mirror board into the chat, we can do that. I was partly interested in, and I had, I, I wound up waking up this morning dreaming this. Uh, I, I was visualizing sort of several questions that are some of the questions that are in the middle of this issue, like um, how biased is liberal media and how might one go about thinking about that? Uh, how much is the far right being shut down? And I had several other questions kind of formulated. And then I was going to try to figure out how to map different points of view on the same sorts of issues and maybe have us collaborate on the Miro board posting thoughts, ideas, resources, whatever else. Um, yeah, Michael writes that I like that we got uncomfortable. And um, it was really interesting because I find um, just my own experience of, for instance, the pandemic is that when people are dying and shit's going on and things get squishy, um, some of us, probably me included, tend to want to find a party line so that we can get lots of people collaborating in the same way. Uh, thereby skipping past the useful exercise of public thinking and discourse, which is the thing that would actually get people aligned and co collaborating. And so part of what I ended up thinking at the end of the call, just reflecting on, was how poorly, how little trust there was in the environment, um, how the pandemic arose at a moment of low trust of governments and media anyway and how all of the above proceeded to act in ways that more often than not broke trust rather than grew trust and that that trust in those conversations and the sharing of evidence and open questions and the ability to to open those questions might i'll, I'll underscore might have led to more trust and more sorting out these issues um and then another thought, and then I'll stop and see who else would just like to sort of jump in, how complicated some of these issues are. Like, like at some point, the, the lab leak hypothesis came up in, in the call last week, and, and Grace said, you know, uh, I don't know why the lab, the lab leak 
or wild origins is so controversial, and I'm paraphrasing badly here, uh, but she basically said, like, it, it doesn't make any difference to the virus where it came from, but it makes a difference to how we treat it and what, you know, what we might do going forward. And I was like, yeah, and there's probably geopolitics behind China deciding to protect all the information about what happened and the U.S. making accusations about lab leak, which would then make this a, an international political incident as opposed to an international healthcare incident. And that very likely played in somewhere that we don't know about, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a little bit like this morning, uh, Brittany Griner got traded for Victor Blom or whatever his name is, uh, the, the merchant of death, uh, an arms dealer that <laughs> I'm not sure anybody wants on the loose, but hey, that was, that was sort of a swap. And who knows how the sausage got made behind that curtain. Um, so let me pause for a second and, and see where anybody would like to take any of this. Y'all are shockingly <clears throat> untalkative this morning. Shockingly. I thought I thought from watching last week's call that you'd be like, okay, let's go, let's go. So let's go Klaus, then Pete, then Judy. Okay. So I thought what, um, what we missed was a hindsight perspective because now we know what happened. Right? So in the fog of war, so to speak, I mean, in the, in the fog of the crisis, uh, a lot of issues um and, and controversies and so on were, were flowing through but at the end of the day the united states came out uh, with flying colors right the um we we the way we are handling covid today um is is exemplary our, our economy functions our um so our there hospitals are, lots are not of, but, our, but our but our deaths were way worse than most countries. We had a shocking number of deaths here. Right. So now compare that to China. China can't open its economy. I mean, they're damned if they do and damned if they don't, because their response simply wasn't uh, 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 as effective as ours. So where we are today, right? Uh, China today, if they open their economy, they have a million deaths. Um, because they haven't solved the problem of uh, immunizing the population, of educating the population in ways that uh, that helps them and makes sense. So when you look back, um, we've done, I mean, as, as, as crazy as it was and as tumultuous as it was, um, we have done a pretty good job to find a middle road, is what I thought. Um, that's what I thought. Us. And 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 I don't want us to sort of relitigate who which country had the best outcomes. I think that the that topic right now is like really complicated and and touchy and hot. Um, but appreciate that 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 we're at a place where we can sort of look back on it in in that kind of way. And and maybe it's a topic for a future call to sort of unpack more of that. And I know that Pete's wife. Uh, spent a tremendous amount of time during the pandemic actually going in and figuring out what was up and i wish that i i don't think she was posting any of that publicly was she pete i'm like my heart is like oh god i, I would have i would have given a lot to to be able to peek over her shoulder digitally to see what she was finding and, and where it was going um so let's go pete judy kevin you're a new Couple things mistake. first. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed last week's call, so I'm missing a bunch of context. Uh, it appears, and I also kind of wanted to recognize Rick's um, thought in chat that it'd be better if Grace were here because she set the agenda. Um, having said that, I'll I'll keep on. Uh, so, um, Klaus, thanks for thanks for that uh, view viewpoint that the America America has done well. I, I would have to strongly disagree. Um, I think I think we've had an extremely bad uh, failure of uh, public health, public policy, public health policy, um, uh, and we let um, we let our society get divided across the line where it didn't need to get divided, and it's going to be deleterious to us for decades probably to come so the thing that 
the thing that's easy to say up front and hard to take back is that I think we're talking about COVID, right? Um, uh, from what I understand and from what um, my wonderful wife, you know, she's done an amazing amount of research and knows a lot and doesn't tell anybody because it's not popular to tell people anything. You know, even if you say, I think this is true, but I don't know, or, you know, I, you know, this is something I think, and I don't care if you, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, but from what I know, from what my wife knows, uh, COVID is a long-term uh, thing. It's not a short-term thing. Um, it, it does uh, insidious and often invisible damage uh, to the lining of your blood vessels and your blood vessels go everywhere in your body. So it randomly uh, attacks and, and disables random systems in your body and different for different people. And then, you know, it's kind of a statistical thing. Oh, great. My liver didn't get affected. You know, my, my brain didn't get affected. My, you know, and, and people go through that and think they got through it with flying colors. But, um, uh, but there's a bunch of stuff that's like common sense that we should be thinking about that we don't, you know, um, we should be cleaning indoor air a lot more. Um, the reason we don't have cholera all over the time, all over, all over all the time is because we cleaned our water. So right now we're, we're breathing dirty, filthy and in, infectious air all the time and think it's completely normal. So in, and then in that environment, um, my wife and I mask all the time when we're out, out indoors with other people. Um, no, very few other people are. And, and it feels really weird to be, you know, the, the idiot that's the idiot that's trying to take care of themselves in the face of, you know, a bad situation. Um, and so I think what we're going to find is that, so you don't really get um, immune immunity to, to COVID. You get a little bit for a short time from a vaccine or from getting sick. Um, it, it trashes your immune system. Um, Joanne says it, it, uh, it really knocks out your T cells, uh, at least in some people. And that means that you're gonna get sick more easily next time, either with COVID, another COVID, um, or with RSV or flu or you know, whatever, uh, staff A. Um, certain number of those people are going to be sick for, for a long time, months or years. Um, many of them are going to die. It's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's heartbreaking to me to watch a country that I thought was a thought leader or smart or able to, you know, well, you're I, being optimistic I grew up there. Well, you know, I, I, I swallowed the Kool-Aid back when I was a, a teenager in the, you know, the 70s and 80s. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not, not you know, I, I'm, I'm not that disillusioned anymore, but I'm, I'm still aghast at the failure of public health policy in the U.S. And even now, um, you know, the, the COVID, the, the, the folks that my wife hangs out with who think that we know about COVID, and see, I have to say it that way. It's like, I think I know how biology works and I think I kind of know what COVID does. Not that I can tell anybody that because they're gonna say, oh, you believe in the science. I believe in the science and it says, you know. Um, uh, uh, the, the CDC, it's, it's a joke, like literally a joke at this point. The CDC used to be a well-respected global institution of science and it, it stumbled and kept, kept falling first under Trump and then it just de declined and declined de and declined. And, you know, recently the CDC finally said, well, um, even if we don't tell you, you have to mask, maybe you should mask anyway. And a bunch of the COVID people were like, you know, it's bad when the CDC says you might start wanting to think about wearing a mask. And, you know, it's like, that's the, the weakest sauce like recommendation it could have made. And I understand kind of why it was so weak sauce because no matter what you say anymore, people get really upset. And, you know, um, thanks to Mr. Trump and then um, probably a, a bunch of political stuff after that, uh, we got ourselves into a situation where, 
even talking about something like this is just fracturing of society and you know and it's it's really frustrating and i'm i you know so i'm, I'm maybe i'm a little bit glad that you know that our economy didn't get as trash as it could have or something like that i really wonder if so i'll, I'll not go, go down that line that i i feel and i maybe this is a rationalization maybe this is not i think we the us in particular was driven pretty hard by external forces um external na nation actors and maybe some internal ones we were driven pretty hard to continue opening a wedge in a wedge issue you know so um forces of disinformation that want to take the us down a notch whether they're internal or external they look for a wedge issue like abortion rights or you know um uh whether you know what color your skin is or something like that and you just kind of like drive a wedge in and you split you split society. This was an, an astonishingly effective one um, and left us like, like a patient flayed open, like writhing around, you know, like literally dying by the millions. And I think, I think it's going to continue for five years. You know, in five years, we're going to wake up and say, oh my God, what did we do five years ago? Why weren't we, why weren't we paying attention? So. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Judy, then Kevin, Carl. Well, I, my thoughts are a bit of swirl because I'm trying to both listen responsibly and, and retain the thought I thought when I wanted to talk. But it, it seems to me, not to oversimplify, but it comes down to a couple of key things, both of which involve trust, because we don't trust our news sources for many good reasons. We don't trust the government, partly for good reasons and partly because of artificial polarization that's been introduced as Pete suggested. And we don't really trust the medical community or science in the underpinnings of understanding stuff. And so some of the, the major science societies are starting to look at this issue of trust in science, because if you can't trust science or only the scientists trust science because they can critically discern if the experiment was done right, then we don't have the foundation for solid content and knowledge to then give the community, which doesn't want to listen if it disagrees with what their local population says, because their sense of needing to belong overcomes their sense of independence and seeking of knowledge. And it's kind of frightening because we've become so polarized and because individual states are letting those politics affect what they'll allow people to do or what they'll support doing. Some states will let you get Paxlovid if you have a positive test. Conservative states like Texas will only allow it if you're in the government suggested groups of over 65 or have a pre-existing condition. So there's a whole population in Texas that's getting less treatment than would be optimal for the disease because they're under 65 and they don't have a critical disability already even though we know that COVID promotes all sorts of long-term consequences to health that will ultimately be very damaging to people. So I think the conversations that we've had about trust as a general principle almost needs to be segmented into different kinds of trust in order for us to be able to attempt, if it's possible, to influence a change in trust or a change in effective communication of informed content. There's so much disinformation out there that's polarizing and disruptive, and it's deliberately positioned, I believe, by evil parties. And that's really destructive, but it's the kind of pandemonium that can contribute to a breakdown in all sorts of civil processes. And as soon as you get people scared that there's gonna be an uprising in their neighborhood, they're a lot more tolerant of controlled state things that are not the foundation of our history. So I don't mean to be such a downer, <laughs> but it's a really big problem. And it would be helpful if we could discern leverage points or discern some consistency of practices and behaviors, communicate trust of those practices and behaviors to other people, so forth. I'm always the only person in a room with a mask on now. I'm still masking. I am over 65, relatively healthy, <clears throat> but 
it's frightening to me that to go anywhere in public, I'm going to be surrounded by people who are not masked, who most likely are carriers, if not active with COVID. And that's just not a great way to live. <laughs> um, so. Judy, thank you for that. And your, your whole life has been science. Like you are still involved in scientific associations and all that. Um, and looking at what Rob just put into the chat, like how do you reflect back on on where where are we with science and life and this thing right now? Like, oh, that's a big question. You, how does this make I mean, you feel about about your role or vantage point into science? Personally, it makes me feel really stubborn <laughs> because it's just science is science. It's supported by data that can be duplicated by other people in the simplest of statements, <laughs> and it's the best approximation that we have right now because new information might change the whole ballgame. So if, if, if we could somehow communicate that's how science works, as conundrum as it is, that would help a lot. I think that informed organizations as opposed to individuals need to take stronger positions on things. They're afraid to do it because of public reaction, a lot of other things. But if, if you get editorials within science journals that are more available to the public, or there's more communication in the media about science from trusted news sources, whoever they may be, um, or there's podcasts. Somehow we have to break this information lockdown in order to cause people to say, maybe I don't know what's really right or true. I mean, that's the fundamental thing. In science, you kind of don't believe anything till it's proved seven times and tested by five other people, but that's not how human beings think. They're influenced by how many of their friends think X more than anything else. Alive. And so reaching communities, reaching people with an alternative message or perhaps even an alternative question rather than a message, but not everyone has the skill sets to actually do the research like Pete's wife has done. And I try to stay up to date on a lot of stuff to the extent I can, but I'm out of date as a scientist. Um, but you know, I might spend two hours tracking down a bunch of these references just to see whether they make sense to me before I'm gonna start quoting them. <laughs> and that's the science process, but that's not the human process. The human right. process is, do I trust person A? Person A told me this, therefore I think it's truth. I'll promulgate it as my truth because I don't have time to look into it. And, and then, sorry, go ahead. No, that I, I'm rambling here, but it's just, it's something that really bothers me so much that I'm considering backing off from a bunch of stuff to try to figure out what I can actually do about this and through what agency. Because it isn't just the science groups. The science groups trust each other. But if the American Chemical Society says, this is good or this does or doesn't break down or this goes to this body organ, nobody's gonna see it except the 150,000 members of ACS and another 100,000 other scientists who tangentially watch that stuff. And that doesn't influence the media. So I actually think that the Fauci type positions are really critical and they need to be more public even though it's unpopular these days for them to make public statements because of government and political reactions. Mm -hmm. And I think these, there's a naivety in America too that there aren't deliberate disruptive forces at work that have uh -huh. really amplified the divides in thought and worked hard to amplify those divides in thought because that level of unrest facilitates movement toward dictatorships. I completely wholeheartedly agree with that latter statement and would love to be would love to be proven wrong. Kevin then Carl. You're muted. So I've been thinking about, you know, where lack of trust started, and I have one path to how we got here. Back in about 1905, a church in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, published what they called the Fundamentals, which was an epistemology to uh, regard the other. And these were folks who felt overwhelmed by what was called modernism at the time. But their epistemology has proven to be modular and replicable. And what they said is, you know, uh, they wanted to uh, um, 
be militant and separatist and use proof texts where possible as if they were weapons. And that way of, of uh, saying that you have to be separate and literal and, and uh, separatist, it's a warlike kind of thing, made them afraid of slippery slope coalitions and partnering. So I was doing uh, investigative religion reporting in 2003 when the Episcopal Church was trying to elect the first openly gay bishop. And I was everywhere on that thing. And there was one meeting between, uh, a potential meeting that they wanted to vote to have between North and South Korean people of the same faith. And this group that was funded by the folks who wanted, who had taken over several other denominations with that methodology worked for the Southern Baptists, it worked for the, for the Methodists, it worked for several places to split the, the Presbyterian Church, that same epistemological methodology of militant and separatist and using texts as if they say everything. <clears throat> they, you know, they, they, they use the text around what could be homosexuality or it could be temple prostitution, and they ignore the next text next to it that said, don't eat shellfish. Um, anyway, they, they said, why are you against this? Just this meeting of North and South Koreans of the same faith as well, you're demonizing. And they said, well, they need to be demonized. Otherwise, there will be infection you know, coming in. And that way of thinking uh, became two things. It became um, aligned with the state. Trump mostly aligned it himself. And that created the whole kind of Christian nationalism. And around the same time or a little earlier, uh, you know, Zuckerberg realized you can make more money if you cause people to fight more. And this way of thinking causes people to fight more. And helping people on the left also see these people as being militant and separatist with the people on the right who are acting out of fear. I think it leads to where we are. And then we found that the, the modular epistemology of fundamentalism cooked up in this uh, Baptist church in Fort Worth, Texas in 1905 is is a key uh, is a key way of seeing truth that uh, that I think is is at the heart of our lack of trust and it's also a, a huge money maker. You're muted, Jerry. Shit, 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 shit. So sorry. Newbie mistake. First time on Zoom. Um, sorry, Kevin Wow. And um, is the link that I put in the chat the right link to the fundamentals? Is that the, the document set of documents you're talking about? And then I just want to do a Vulcan mind meld with you on this topic because I just, you have so much rich context here about how this affected the church and the politics and dynamics uh, and power dynamics of, of the Christian nationalist movement and all that, that I don't have. And I'm, I'm like, holy crap, you've just like popped the lid on a, on a bunch of, on a bunch of stuff that's happened in the world that I wasn't aware of. And you're muted. Yeah. Um, you know, one other thing that makes the left uh, incapable of responding uh, showed up in uh, Barbasi's book, book linked on what right to life groups did versus freedom of choice groups. And the right to life groups uh, were able to make single issue partnerships and uh, 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 forget about what they uh, didn't agree about. <clears throat> and I saw that when I was being an undercover reporter in a meeting where the, a group that was against uh, women in the priesthood and they were nine points against it, met with the group that was leading the charge against gay folks. And they said, we'll forget about being against women. And I saw them have that nine points and they, they eliminated five of them and agreed on four and the deal was done. <clears throat> and whereas uh, the freedom of choice groups needed a litmus test of what you agreed about. And so you had to agree about four or five different issues. And so their sites only linked arithmetically, whereas the more effective, uh, Christian right who can compartmentalize things grew geometrically. So it, you know, there, there is a way that the holistic approach of the left makes them weaker in any battle. Uh, and that's another whole part of it. But I, I'm, thanks, I haven't thought about that epistemology in a long time. 
but uh, I think it's a, you know, it really is one of the creepy modules in the new operating system. And it's been co-opted by, you know, Caesar slash whatever. Just like the, the original um, Christian thing was co-opted by, you know, uh, Constantine and, and whatever and made a tool of uh, making people docile when they've been willing to give up their lives to fight the state, you know, the week before. Um, and so, you know, it's an interesting, you know, it, that piece is still there, militant separatist and using a text as a weapon uh, and you choose which text. And so it, 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 it's the most effective weaponization uh, that happens as opposed to the thing that both best represents the ethos of who you were intending to be. So uh, you know, I'm not sure what other, you know, what is the, as I look back at, um, just finish this up in Inouye County, where my family's from. <coughs> they voted um, only seventeen percent voted for uh, against Trump in the last election, and one percent more got vaccinated. So it was eighteen percent got vaccines, and so it was only a little bit of leakage uh, went out to public health. Uh, and so I, I think it, they're acting against their own best interests. In, in to believe a world they need to believe in. I, I think complex contagion explains why these groups can be closed like that in a way, which is also complex contagion is why OGM is so much more valuable as a closed group than as an open group, which is another whole point that I'll just stop with. Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate your crossover there to the other the other topic. Um, and, and Kevin, thank you so much for, for the detail. As I said, I'd love to absorb even lots more. Um, Carl, then Dave. The, um, well, I got kind of a, seg a segue and stuff because uh, I went, being in DC area, we had a prayer for peace event years ago, Jackson Brown and Crosby and Nash and a whole bunch of, because I had a concert and then it was, uh, whole by the bunch of the um, Tibetan monks and 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 things and I was having a conversation with somebody I was like peace you got a problem with that <laughs> and the one Tibetan monk was kind of taken aback a bit but uh, mill peaceful um, I've got <laughs> a, um, I'll post the link to the general page but I don't know how many people have seen the Dan Goodspeeds diagrams I've got I've got one um, that's configured, so I have to share screen and and things. They need to be experienced. They're just devastating. Uh, do you want to share screen? And I'll I'll to... share screen in a minute. Okay. I just wanted to provide a little context. And then the other thing, um, one of the reasons why they were really downplaying masks. And the importance of them is because uh, the supply chain, they caused the panic and then we didn't have any masks. We would have been, I think that that was kind of a major factor in, in things. It was yet, yet another mistake, judgment yeah. mistake early in the process, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you wanna, you just muted yourself by accident? Actually, that was the other thing too. I, um, I was holding the space bar down. so. You can mute yourself oh. all the time. And then if you hit the space bar, you can hold down the space bar just while you're talking. Push the talk kind of feature. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, Do you want to screen share or come back yeah, in later? I'll, yeah, I'll screen share. OK. Yes. Well, I picked February 12th because that's um, when my dad got his first, first vaccine. I've, I've filtered out all the ones except the very democratic and very Republican states. And since I first saw it, he's had actually added in the US average and stuff. Whoa. I love bar chart races. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is the desk by state partisanship mm -hmm. and so I can skip ahead. Holy crap. Yeah, so that's the- Will you share a link to that on the-, on the Yeah, I'll, I'll post the link. So then he's got it by the most deaths or by the fewest. 
Right. And well, the one thing you can see is that there are not very many, <laughs> very Democrat <laughs> states <Right>. in comparison <clears throat> and stuff. But yeah, as I, and really understanding the the um, way he's normalizing the data, you know, because you're comparing apples to oranges to the whole fruit salad. So. <laughs> Carl, have, have you, just a question in there, have you looked at the way those deaths uh, result in voting totals for the uh, midterms? Um, no, I haven't looked at, I haven't seen what he's done with it, but he, he's definitely yeah. the, uh, yeah. the Dead folks don't yeah. vote except in Chicago. So is the thesis, <laughs> Kevin, yeah. Kevin is, is the thesis that's that- like the, That's like the, um, that's like the thing about tobacco. It's like it's a great business, except you have to find a way to replace the four hundred thousand loyal customers you lose every year. Yeah. So, so the thesis here is that the far the the right has basically killed off its voter base and lost the elections because those people just died. I I think that's it. It's an easy and fun thing to think, but the number nope. of deaths, the percentage of deaths, is actually fairly small. I think it's an effective strategy to kill off, you know, 1% of your base in the name of consolidating that base. Mm. I mean, mathematically, I don't mean that in any human way. Obviously, that's not human at all, I don't think. Yeah. But um, just because a lot of people are dying, it, it actually, you know, it, and it's easy to say, it's not the it's not the disease it's the vaccine i don't know why you people are even getting vaccinated at this point you know right. and that kind of stuff it it just locks in your determination to keep you know to keep drinking the kool-aid it it doesn't you know because you've lost a, a one or two percent of the kool-aid drinkers you know that that doesn't mean that you've lost the the voting uh, population right um Carl, thank you for reminding me of Dan Goodspeed's charts. I'd totally forgotten about them, and they are compelling. Um, are you are you done with that? Um, I had one more thing, but I'll. It'll okay. come back. It'll come back to you. Yeah. We can pop. We can pop back. In a different to you. context. <laughs> uh, Dave, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think I, I hopped on uh, as Kevin was talking, and so I was immediately went. I wanted to highlight this uh, David Sloan Wilson uh, keynote speech that he gave to a bunch of theolog theologians, and I just found it really compelling. I mean, one was this notion of adaptive fictions, which he you know talks about having. You know, I think religion is probably an example of things that are fictions, but that somehow help the anti you know the, uh, the society adjust to different issues, and. And he's talking in the in the in the keynote about how humanity, as as humanity is becoming an organism, right, and acting like an organism in the way a beehive is an organism, and that we're doing it at a tribal level, and that he then equates it to good within a group, you know, good is doing good things in your group, and doing and bad is doing bad things in your group, but a good thing in your group might be a bad thing to a different group. And so then you have this, that's where a lot of the conflict across groups come from, right? So you can kind of, that maybe help understand a little bit of the MAGA world where, you know, things that to me look evil are good in their context, you know, and often they're good because of an adaptive fiction, which is like really weird, right? So, you know, they're trying to, you know, promote the, the apocalypse or something like that, which is a good thing in their group, <laughs> but doesn't look right. good to me outside their group. Anyway, I just thought I thought it was a really, really interesting talk. And they, Kevin, it seems like it was up your up your alley. Thanks. Dave. Yeah, thanks. I was actually talking about David Wilson this morning because his group's use of uh, Hilo is probably the best of, of the, their that applications online community. And I've worked with David on a couple of things. He's the leading practitioner of Eleanor Ostrom's work. So there's a lot to like about what he's what he's. He's, yeah, he's, he's doing some interesting things. I haven't looked at that, but they're actually, it's up on Trinity Wall Street, which is our main funder. So that's interesting in many ways. Thanks. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I was like, I, I chased it because of reading, uh, Atl I think I probably pitched this before, but reading Atlas Hugged, which is his attempt at fiction, which is like really horrible fiction, but it's got a couple of fun ideas in it. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, is the keynote available as a video? Because I, I see only the PDF transcript there. Which is fine. I will download that.
Mm. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so where does that put us? Um, I'm wondering oh. whether this would lead us to contemplate alternative, potentially insidious forms of communication of influence. <laughs> I mean, to me, what we need is alternative press, almost like during the revolution, you had to have free press. And somehow we have to mobilize larger numbers and reach larger numbers. It doesn't do much good, except help us rationalize our discomfort for all of us to sit together and talk about our shared perspectives because it doesn't result in change action unless we can take those messages to other organizations that have more span of control and influence. And I think the general public isn't the right place to take it. As much as I love the general public, there aren't enough people who actually have time and energy because of personal circumstances, let alone capacity to actually three, think through and discern issues. I mean, we're talking at a really elevated level here and it feels comfortable and common because we're all at the same level of simultaneous analysis and interpretation and listening and judging and all of those factors. But I don't find that a lot when I go out into more general public communities. And I have to be sensitive to that to be able to have a pur purposeful conversation. It's sort of like I have to read the room or read the group and then decide how to position my comment in a way that will allow them to hear it. And that's a challenging, that's challenging as a personal dynamic, let alone as a societal one. And I think that's a lot of what we're facing here is this inability to communicate with people in a way that has credibility and shared intent. Uh, I want to jump in for a sec before going to Stacy, um, because you just triggered a bunch of things that connect for me. Um, my amateur history of the press of the news business is that the earliest newspapers were completely political rags they were from political parties they were completely biased uh, and then sort of uh, some of them start getting big and then the original arthur oaks buys the new york times and invents objective journalism and says we're going to print all the news is fit to print and be objective and that's a new thing uh, and then that grows because people are like, oh, good, we have objective news. Then I think later is yellow journalism, which is the battle between William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer, who gets the Pulitzer Award named after him. Try and see that a nice way to cleanse a reputation because he was, you know, he and he and Hearst basically invent yellow journalism, which is this titanic, exaggerated, crazy ass battle in the public view over public opinion. That's what it is. And then and then we have the inner tubes show up, which just tear um, news every which way and create new kinds of profits and kick out the the stool of of classified. You know, Craigslist busy sort of eats the classified business all by itself, and local media starts to wither and die. And now we have there. You know, there was a new newspaper Death Watch uh, website for years. It's probably still there. <clears throat> But um, I thought hyper-local media might help. And for a while, that was a slightly hot thing. And then it seems to have petered out. And I'll, so now the news business is in real trouble in lots of different ways. And I think one of the questions is, should we be trying to rescue or improve the news media or should we ignore it and find some new way to collaborate with each other? Um, into which I'll throw in my take on consumer and consumerism, which is that we replaced civic activities with shit like, hey, everybody, go be a sports fan and go out and yell for the Redskins now renamed uh, or whoever else. And, and like, go pump up jingoism and patriotism for your city um, instead of actually participating in civic activities. We replaced civic activities. We outsourced them to voting, which you get to do every now and then which is the result of a consumer mass marketing exercise. The reason political parties want a lot of money from us is to feed it into mainstream media ads and new and digital media ads to come back to convince us of one point of view or the other, which bears little resemblance to actual functioning democracy to me. So, so what I'm saying is the media and the democratic functions are all eaten by all of these forces that have destroyed them. And one of the reasons OGM exists as an entity is, hey, 
Could we puzzle our way through to figure out how to share what we know, share the big open questions, connect them to scientists, connect them to journalists, connect them to students, connect them to policymakers, and change how that shit is happening? Because we're in real trouble if we don't fix that. In the spirit of what you just said, Judy, like, like we should have collective collaborative inquiry so that we can solve these problems in a credible way. And at this point, so many of the, the, the entities that are out there are not credible or have lost credibility or are weak and broken <clears throat> that we need to do something pretty dramatic to stand this thing up, I think. Um, and there's a whole other thread I, I, won't go, I won't go back to, but I'll just point to, which is how, just exactly how broken is the mainstream media is an active question I have, because I still look for news items to tell me who killed whom, where, when, and what happened, and how much can you fudge that. Um, and then as I'm reading those, I'm filtering for, oh, that's an opinion. Oh, and I put Peru in the in the chat just a little while ago. I just want to throw that in real quick because um, I grew up in Peru and I, I care about Peru. And the news articles around the recent uh, ejection of the president by Congress in Peru make it sound like the president tried to pull a coup when my amateur understanding from the outside is that the Peruvian Congress is completely corrupt and bought and is almost unfixable because they've changed the constitution in ways that make it so that it stays corrupt and that they basically ejected a reasonable president before he managed to dissolve Congress. Um, and so I, it really concerns me that the public opinion on this is, oh my God, thank God Peru just avoided a coup by the president. When in fact, I think the opposite is what we ought to be thinking. We ought to be thinking, how do we help Peruvians get through a really crappy political situation on the ground? Sorry to put 800 things in the conversation. Stacy, you just fell off the, the, the queue. Is it because you decided to step out and I said too many things or would you like to step back in? Um, well, I don't think I can remember everything I wanted to say, but I <laughs> did want to. That's why I use the chat as a, as a, as a helper along the way. Sorry, go ahead. But I did want to connect what Judy was saying with what Michael put in the chat early about last week's call, which was the discomfort, because all of that is tied in and not just in like, you know, a lot of this conversation is focused on the creation of the media. I think I'm more focused on how we consume it. Um, somebody put in the chat about the nuances being left out. And just to push back, Judy, on one thing when you talk about the public, because one of the things that the public, I think, can be taught to do that, you know, I hope that I help in this is to talk to other people to get those nuances. The call we were on last week was an example of that. But we were all people that cared about each other. And but we we still had those differences of opinion. So Again, I don't think there was enough. I would like to have maybe at another time a, a deeper call about the discomfort because when Michael put in the chat, you know, that I, I wrote, it was more uncomfortable to some of us than others. And the reason I put that, it, I, I went back and I watched the call. It was not as clear to me watching it how uncomfortable I really was at the time. But I spoke up on that call, which was something that was super uncomfortable for me. I don't know how much it comes across, but I think it was so important. And I think it led to some really positive movement. And I don't know, Doug, you were there, but I think if I hadn't mentioned something, further reflection would not have occurred that then was communicated. And I think we moved in a positive step towards building trust, you know, and I see you nodding. So I hope you agree. So I, I left the call feeling good about it, but it was hard and I was flustered and I wasn't prepared and not everybody's gonna, you know, like Pete said earlier, it's not, you know, people don't, don't feel comfortable saying what's not popular. So I'll just stop there for now. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. And just from my watching of the call, I couldn't tell how much stress or distress you were under, but I appreciated what you brought into the call and it did change things. Doug, did you want to comment on that real quick before I pass to Kevin? Yeah. Um, so, so imagine that um, 
the human energetic and emotional layer, um, were actually visible and prioritized first. And then all the it's that provoke those responses were subordinated to that. We might avoid a bunch of wars and conflict and stuff. Sort of like, you know, that thing about the perfect reflection in a lake and you turn it upside down. And, and I think, Stacy, what you're speaking to and where the real, where the real juice is and where the real opportunity and potential lies um, is figuring out how to invert that in fact, in practice, in reality. Um, and, and feel and sense into how to do that. <laughs> just, just like as a fundamental idea of like, how do we, how do you even do that inversion? How do you like, what does it look like? How do you play? How do you express yourself? How do you listen to other people? Like on a really fundamental level, our you know, educationally, programmatically, you know, I'm imprinted from birth not to do that. Everything in the system is set up to stop human beings from uh, being human and from a place of connection with their own agency and with their own voice. And they're like, and feelings are really powerful sources. If you don't have emotions, behind whatever the it is you're trying to create or transform or change, nothing will happen. I can't, like it's impossible to achieve or affect a change or manifest something different. Like they're the source, they're the energetic source. And um, so, yeah, I think you were, you're dead on point and your share was dead on point. And it is the discomforts where the dragons lie, like where the, where the answer is like. So I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Kevin, then Scott. You're muted, Kevin. Kevin, you're muted. You're muted. I put a link to deep canvassing in the chat, and it's been a proven methodology to change the view of the other. Uh, it, but it, it works in certain contexts, and I would suggest it doesn't work for OGM to do it, but it has worked for embattled people who feel threatened to talk to the other and not come in trying to convert, but to listen. And so these were gay folks in LA who did it, and it changed a lot. And then it was, uh, it's been done by Palestinians across to Israelis. And it's been done, you know, in, in rural North Carolina and other places, deep ways with folks who are committed to living as the 17 to 18 percent in Inawama County, which uh, we've all left, but who will stay there in conversation. And you have to be persistent and patient and not come in to convert. And I think, you know, OGM is like a lot of groups I'm in where we say, how do we get them to be as enlightened as we are? And we don't know them and we don't really like them. And that never works, but it's always a persistent kind of thing we say. And I think it, it works if you're persistent and feel some level of threat, of, 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 of threat you know, uh, and, and you, you are willing to stay in relationship with folks with whom you disagree a lot. So it's, if you're serious, it's a real methodology. I, I think we should not talk about how we can reach them because we won't. This is not what this group is about. So that's, that's my point. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm interested in your, so I'm a big fan of deep canvassing. My understanding of it is just, it's different from canvassing, which is normally, here's a brochure, please for, for my guy, move on to the next door. Yeah. It's, Sit, sit and have a conversation, but it's not a methodology like nonviolent communication. It doesn't have the depth of anything like those things. Or am I missing something about deep canvassing here? Yeah, I think you are. And and I would, and there is stuff in uh, I, 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 David. The, the birth of this thing, as I know it, is from uh, the folks who were the LGBT folks in uh, in LA who did it and then made it into a methodology. Uh, so there, I mean, there is a methodology, and it, and it, uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's long and it's listening and it's finding out what they care about and what they're afraid of and finding the, the points in common between them. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, but yeah, it, it is, it isn't just, you know, yeah, there, 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 oh my there, God. there are, uh, deep canvas. The dead is awesome. Ken. I know that was really, that was fun. really, that was really but good. Yeah, there, there, it, it is a thing and you can be trained in it. And there, <laughs> there, there's groups in North Carolina that train folks. Thank and I realized I don't have the patience to do it, but I admire them. Uh, Scott, then Judy. Um, okay, so uh, Kevin, this idea of being in relationship with someone we disagree with. I like that a lot. Um, because I think that means that you're you're hanging on. You might be at arm's length the whole time, pulling against each other, but you're not letting go. And I think that's in the spirit of what we were, I think, Jerry, you had framed this weak call as something about making the space more comfortable for people with different opinions or something like that. Um, and what I wanted to offer up was something, I had a new understanding of marriage in the last couple of uh, couple of years. And it was, I'm not leaving. And how many relationships do you have in your life where that's married or otherwise, where that is, that's bedrock. You know what? I'm not leaving. And I didn't have any reason to leave. That's not what I'm, what I'm saying. It, it, what I'm saying is that it changes, it fundamentally changes a relationship with another person. Because then what happens is whatever problem you have, you are stuck with for the rest of your time together if you don't enter in and fight that little dragon, which will continue to grow and grow and grow. And you don't want to fight it. You don't want to open up that door because what happens is then, well, they might, you know, what if I say something and they're upset and, and I've, now they leave. So now I'm not going to say anything. Is that better or is that worse? It's better right now, but it's much, much worse in the long run. And when you don't have that two people who are saying, I'm in relationship with you, no matter what, then you have no incentive to enter into that difficult conversation so that you can get through that tunnel, get to the other side and come to a place where, you know what, we went through this difficult thing, but now we don't have to deal with it anymore because now we we have figured out maybe what the root cause was. Maybe the one thing that you can do or that I can do that makes it a little better or makes it acceptable that we never dealt with. We never actually got to, oh, that's all you want me to do? Okay, you know what? I can do that. But you wouldn't have that conversation if you didn't have this kind of relationship with something. And that's for what I'm offering up here is that I don't know, I just I like that idea. And and I that was an area in my own life where I agree it's incredibly difficult and you cannot have that relationship with a thousand people. I I believe. Um because it is so, you know what? You can say something that's 180 degrees from me, and yet. I still am hanging on. And um, yeah, so there, that's that's a comment. Thanks, Scott. I'm sort of going to take the layup and extend what you just said to <clears throat> online spaces and politics in, in larger groups. In part, one of the problems with online spaces is that it's so easy to leave. Uh, another problem is identity and pseudonymity and all that kind of stuff. But it's just so easy to leave that that doing damage and just moving on is like pff, whatever. And there isn't that ability to couple people into I'm not leaving. And then 
we were also a very mobile, very transient, modern society. And that transience has hurt us a lot in the sense of don't like what your community's up to, just, just leave instead of stay and try to fix it and try to talk it through and get to know people. And then a bunch of other things, including air conditioning and television, drove us inside. So we're not out on the porch talking and watching the kids. There's a whole series of forces that 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 are kind of crazily changing society as we just kind of exist through it that break us away from the kind of commitment or promise that you just um, described, which is a lovely thing that I think maybe many of us miss. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that offer, Scott. Uh, Judy Carl Michael. Um, well, the conversation always shifts so much in the time between when I raise my hand. But what I wanted to offer was some experiences that, that I've observed in terms of communication processes that work in groups in addition to one-on-one. -on -one. But if, if someone in a group voices a viewpoint that's quite different, um, there, there are questions that are helpful and comments that are less helpful. And so I find that if, if you can say, help me understand where you're coming from on this, um, have you considered this other position rather than stating the opposition point? Because there's a, an energy transfer that occurs in the kind of exchanges that we're talking about. And physicists have recently been able to measure it, call it interpersonal energy transfer. But but the actual dynamics of the presence that we each bring into the encounter influences the people in the encounter, particularly in a physical sense. But I believe that a lot of it is much more complex than that because I can watch the tone shift in our group conversations, which are not physically connected. And it, it's the same type of influence that occurs. And so I think it, it's back to the old adage, think, look first to understand. But I think if you trust the other person enough or display an intention to trust by asking for more information about their perspective, they're much more likely to then hear you say, well, I'm looking at it from a different way, but I think this different thing, and perhaps they'll reciprocate in the listening. And I think that's easier to do one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five or 20 than it is thousands and thousands of people. But somehow, my hope is that somehow we can engage much more of humanity in thoughtful reflection and communication because without that, it's pretty hopeless. There's just not a lot that individuals can do, <laughs> even charismatic leaders. They often just polarize the audiences instead of seeking shared understanding that lets groups of people move forward. And what I really like about OGM is that it is such an, a capable and informed inquisitive group of people who are really interested at pulling apart the questions and trying to understand the different perspectives. So if it could somehow be replicated without unzipping itself, um, or if we could clone it into a lot of other settings, I think it would be a good thing. Thank you, Judy. And um, we could do some work on being more accept accepting of people with different opinions from ours, which I think was illustrated nicely in last week's call. and which we haven't gone back into very well in this call, even though I love what we've been talking about on this call. So um, I'm just sort of uh, sitting with that for a little bit. Uh, Carl Michael Petty. Jerry, I'll, I'll carry that a little further. Um, I, I, I'll share an experience I had recently that's that's gotten me really curious about, about this topic. I went home my husband and I went home to visit my family in Illinois um, for a week. We just came back. Um, my family uh, saying with um, just just for context and hopefully without judgment, uh, you know, they're they're fairly conservative, um, you know, pretty, pretty strong opinions, right leaning Fox News watching cohort. Right. And I'm kind of an oddball um, in my family. And it was really interesting to observe what happened when I was trying to connect with family members, um, it was as if um, I would share something and I could feel or sense that they were, they, they would kind of pull in something from their own experience that didn't totally feel like it related or it, 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 it felt like there was this uh, almost like a physical gap 
between us where my framework was here, their framework was here, and we were trying to meet in the middle, right? And um, uh, it just it just wasn't happening. And my husband had the same experience and we came home. We were like, did you notice this thing? He was like, yeah, that was really weird. And um, And I've been curious about this since then. Like, how do I meet someone in the middle and bridge this gap, you know, when our lenses, our frameworks, our, our way of understanding how the world works or reality are so, so different. And it was really strange and interesting to observe that playing out when both parties were genuinely trying to connect, but it just felt so clunky and 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 um, kind of awkward and kind of forced and a little startling, very interesting. And I'd love to hear what uh, what everyone else thinks about that and if anyone else has experienced that. Thanks, Patty. I think that's fascinating. And um, I'm wondering if anybody has resources or questions, if you can put it in the chat or jump into the queue, because that's a what you're saying is a super common occurrence and a really important thing for us to figure out. And my, the only answer I have off the cuff is the tell me more uh, question, which is like, you know, uh, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm curious. Tell me more is like one of the best opening questions you can ask anybody. Uh, it's non-judgmental. It, it it elicits more information, and maybe you can get to the place where what you what you said crashed against their worldview, because because it feels like what what happened on their side was, man, I just heard something that that sounds like like cuneiform writing, and I'm unclear what it is, so I'll just offer this back, um, and and we don't often take the time to sort of slow down and figure out where there was a mesh or a misfit. Um, so anybody else jump in the queue? Uh, Carl, Michael, Pete. Okay, yeah, I, I posted a link. There's this um, three practice circles phenomenon that we really, there was this couple of um, people, they were in um, Seattle, um, Pacific Northwest area. And then just around time COVID happened, they started going online and stuff. But this three practice circle, and it's, it's actually a fairly simple format. Somebody volunteers to talk for two minutes. Uh, people can ask a follow-up question beginning with, I, you know, Jerry, I'd be curious to know. And then um, people have one minute to respond. A person has one clarifying question and then it moves on to either other clarifying questions or a new volunteer, but they usually keep it strictly to an hour. And I posted a link. They have public um, ones going on. I mean, they, they get into all kinds of issues and stuff, and they're open and stuff. So, and there's also recording and, and things, so you can kind of really check out the site. Um, one of the people is actually getting their PhD, and we, we're really adopting it at Fielding. We've got a, they've actually paid for several people. In the name of equity, they are actually paying for some people to, to um, become uh, um, referees, and uh, we're using it internally with, for some of our DI conversations and stuff. So, and also um, decolonization of the curriculum. That's that's a huge <laughs> topic. So. Thank you. That the whole new can of worms. We should have some some calls about. Um, Michael Pete Doug. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by some of the connective um, threads here. I was um, thinking earlier and posted something in the chat about um, the uncertainty and uncomfortability of looking for truth in the realm of science and the temptation to go to people who are certain and clear about what they believe. Um, and then off of what um has has come up in scott talking about not leaving and and uh judy and patty this thinking about not leaving um including don't don't retreat don't don't leave to go to certainty stay with me us in exploration and uncertainty um you know let let's let's explore this together let's accept that you know you're different than me um but we're not leaving we're here together um that 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 certainty is leaving 
um, certainty that I am wrong, certainty that others are wrong, is is a form of leaving. Um, you know, and and we're all in this together. We're, you know, all in this marriage together, this family together, this uh, community together, nation, uh, planet, and um, well, except maybe for Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, they're they're you know off for other planets. But for the rest of us, um, we're stuck on this rock for a while. Let's let's stay together in uncertainty and not not leave. Love that, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Pete and Doug. Um, thanks, Michael. That was that was great. And similar to kind of what I wanted to say. And Patty, thank you um, for that story. Um, I have a, another story and it may or may not may or may not be helpful. I don't know. I can tell the story. Um, uh, sadly, my father, my 86 year old father died, um, a couple months ago and, uh, that precipitated, uh, uh, my, my family getting together. Uh, I've got two siblings, a brother and a sister. Um, my sister lives in Northern, Northern Nevada, uh, where I grew up and where, uh, my dad was, um, my brother flew in from New York. Um, uh, my my sister and and my cousins in Nevada are kind of like all the way red um, and my brother's kind of purple and I'm all the way blue coastal you know so it's it's a little bit like flying into a, um, a foreign country or something like that where everything is upside down and so um, uh, I, I wore a mask all the time when I was inside with, with folks. Um, I have a really dorky looking, uh, medical looking mask. It's this blue el elastomeric monstrosity, which makes me look like a punk dark Darth Vader or something like that. Thinking of getting a worse one, by the way. But anyway, it, it's very, it stands out. You know, um, Pete is, Pete just came from, you know, some science science medical thing and he's got this big, breathing mask on. I wear it because it's super comfortable and I can wear it forever um, and it doesn't fog up my glasses. So, um, but it's, it's interruptive to people. Um, so it was, it was really interesting being with my family um, uh, that I, and I kind of like really quickly, since Patty, you told your story, I, I kind of quickly went through the, the, the stuff that we told each other to stay together during this difficult time. Um, and do stuff together, even though we have this like complete schism in the way that we believe in reality. So one of them, one of the core ones, thank you, Scott, is I'm not leaving. So my sister and I are, you know, and my brother and I, and all three of us together, we're not leaving each other. And especially, you know, in dealing with the, the aftermath of my father dying, you know, it's like, we're going to stick together and do this thing. We're not going to leave. So we're not leaving. Um, <laughs> okay, Pete, it's kind of weird that you're wearing a mask, but okay, you know, so, um, so going to the funeral director and sitting in the somber, you know, her somber office, and she's trying to be professional and stuff like that, and everyone's in tears and stuff. I've got this like really interruptive mask on, and the, the funeral director is probably one of the people who thinks you're nuts for wearing a mask. My sister is sitting next to me, not batting an eye, I never felt from her like I am embarrassed to be with you. She was like, "This is my brother, you know. He's doing him, you know. Live with it, deal with it." So I, I so appreciated that. So I'm not leaving. You do you. Um, life is hard, and we're all trying to get through it. And we deal with unknowns and uncertainties in different ways. And this is the way I look at my sister too, right? It's like dude, I don't know why you believe the shit that you do, but I know that you're trying your best to get through life and life is hard and it's complicated and you deal with your family, you know, her, 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 her husband and her kids and uh, her in-laws and, you know, it's a whole thing, her, her church, everything like that. It's a whole system in society that she navigates in and she's just trying to do her best. You know, I'm trying to do my best. And so we make these weird decisions, like she's not going to wear a mask and I'm going to wear a mask all the time. And, you know, we forgive each other. Maybe that's the wrong word. We, we accept each other, you know, even though we're different. 
another thing that was really precious to me, um, I've got cousins there who I grew up with and have, we have a lot of fun together. I barely ever see them, but it was a great excuse to get together and have a, a beautiful dinner with some of them out in, in uh, my aunt's backyard. Um, we do this thing, which I think is remarkable, where we joke across the aisle is the way I think of it. Um, so, you know, um, uh, we come from these different cultures. Uh, they live in a culture where guns are kind of a normal thing. I live in an anti-gun culture, which is kind of weird in itself. Um, they believe in, you know, I, I've got a cousin who swears that the King James Bible is the one true truth in the world. <laughs> Um, and I'm like, dude, why the King James version? You know, it's like, if you're going to pick a Bible, why that one, you know, but whatever he's, he's like goes into deep detail and we can sit next to each other and talk about, you know, here's how I see reality. And, and he talks about, here's how I see reality. And they're all kind of like internally consistent and they make sense, you know, internally, at least it's completely separate from, you know, so, so the thing I really love is that we, I guess we've agreed to uh, agreed to disagree in, in lots of places, you know, whether the KGV, KGV is the right thing or not, um, or even a Bible or not, uh, or a mask, a funky looking mask or not. We've agreed to disagree about those things. And really quickly, I was really surprised, like the difference falls away. So I, I um, you know, here I am, I, I'm self-conscious with my mask the whole time I was in Northwestern Nevada. Um, going to stores and stuff, it was, it was hard, you know, um, because I, I kind of look at everybody looking at me and every once in a while you get somebody who looks around like, why is he wearing that thing, you know? Um, and, but, but with my family, like after, the, you know, the first awkward half an hour or something like that, it all melted away and they never saw me as a person wearing this funky blue mask. It was just like, oh, we're, it's just like we're, we're kids again and we just love each other and we're going to be together. We're not going to leave. We're going to let each other be different when we need, when we feel like we need to be different and understand that that difference isn't, you know, it, it, it's not a marker that we're different people. It's a marker that we've had different paths through life and that those paths were, were challenging and you end up in different places, but we, we can still be together for the bulk of it, the, the important part of it. Thanks. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I, um, you know, the game where you put your hand up and the person across from you puts their hand up and you do this. And uh, generally, there'll be a recognition response, like it's fun. And when you take your hand away, um, there's nothing to press against. And in my arc, um, I was in a group and everybody was competing with their offerings, proprietary, ego blocked and related. And I realized like, we don't need another idea. And I let go of my attachments, my quote contributions. And, and, and the further along I got after attachments became beliefs. And so letting go of my attachment to beliefs, worldviews, rights, wrongs, polar, you know, decision points. And I, I let go of all of that. And these days, I come to most every party empty. Like I'm not staked or attached to anything. Um, my purpose is my purpose. And usually it's in, in service to, I'm, a, I'm an, an addict to connection and to serving, to like helping, whatever that may look like for whoever it is that I'm sitting across from in whatever context. And from that place, um, all there is is curiosity and, and connecting. And I don't really create, feed, contribute to, or engage in 
interactions where it polarizes. Like it just doesn't happen because it, it takes both hands pressing against each other to do that. And if I'm, I'm not doing that, it sort of like takes that, um, it takes that manifesting of reality off the table. And, um, and so I, for me, it's in the living of that. Um, so it's a doing, not a, not a thing, not a noun. <laughs> um, and all sorts of interest, like it's, it, there's always something new to learn. There's always like new discoveries. Um, so I'm complete with that. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Patty? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, something something you, you, you mentioned sparked something that's been um, coming up for me the last few days. I've been getting curious around, we use the word beliefs, right? Um, and we each have a different set of beliefs. And I've been, I just feel like the word beliefs to me, the way it feels when I think about that language, it feels kind of like light and... Um, you know, movable. And uh, that's, that's just not how I experience beliefs in, in my own lens and I, how I experience that from others. And I feel like what I've been getting curious about is how, how many of us conflate beliefs with like rules, like this belief that I have kind of ends up, whether I know it or not, becoming this like rule for, for my existence or how, how I am, how I interact with others. And it's um, been playing around with that. And uh that's came up for you recently. So I'm curious to hear what others might think about that. I love that framing, Patty. Um, do you mean, for example, <clears throat> someone raised in a strict religious household is raised absorbing a, a set of rules about what that religion believes and does, whether it's keeping kosher or commandments or whatnot, um, and that they then absorb those rules as given as if they were their beliefs and is that am i being way too simplistic about this good question okay, um think about it for a second um off the cuff to me that feels like a tricky example because i i do think that that correlation likely exists often in, in that meant that directly in that manner in that context religion and rules because i you know i was raised catholic right and i was raised as though these beliefs this doctrine was these hard rules. And if I break the rules, I, that's where I go. Right. And um, so I think that's a really good example, but, and even outside of the context of a religion, if someone help, well, what's, what's a common belief, help me, anyone popcorn. Um, well, I, I would offer that, that a belief is for me, my best understanding to date. <laughs> it's not rigid, but it's purposeful. It's not easily dissuaded because it's been accumulated over my 70 plus years, but that doesn't mean it might not be wrong. Mm. I don't know though, whether that's how other people interpret the word belief, because I have friends for whom I believe belief is more rigid and impermeable. And it's like a, a signpost by which they measure their actions and the actions of others. Mm. And so <laughs> this is the sort of thing where I'd love to, on each con encounter with a new person to say, let's talk about who we are and how we like to communicate and so forth. But that would seem so intrusive to a person you first met that it, it ends up that you just have to sort of observe and de deduce <laughs> and share and see how the sharing is or is not reciprocated and, and, and judge for yourself the flexibility of the person's willingness to hear your viewpoint, even though it differs from theirs. I mean, there's so many dimensions to this that it's really complicated. And I think attempts to simplify it undermine the importance of getting it right. Mm -hmm. And somehow, <laughs> it, that, that's what I love about this group. We're willing to explore endlessly the complexity of something rather than trying to force a quick conclusion but I don't encounter that a lot in other groups of people. And so I take it upon myself, I guess, to subtly 
attempt to influence that mode of communication in the group in a thoughtful way. And sometimes it works and sometimes I just get rebutted vigorously. But then interestingly, often someone else comes in to rebut the rebutter. <laughs> and so these communication dynamics are fascinating. If I were living another life, I might not be a hard scientist. I might be an anthropologist or a social scientist or something because um, I'm fascinated by the impermanence of all of it. <laughs> Those squishy social sciences, I know. So <laughs> they should barely be called sciences at all. And there's the rep reproducibility crisis, all that stuff, but it's so important. Yeah. Um, I just want to riff on Doug's putting the, the hand when you meet hands exercise. There's a Tai Chi exercise called push hands, where one, one, you know, you're sort of one person puts an arm out and the other person goes pushes to and fro. I think Doug knows a lot more about push hands than I do and has done a lot more of it. Uh, who just jumped in the queue. Uh, sorry, Doug Carmichael, I mean. Um, but in push hands, it's all about receiving and maintaining sort of even pressure uh, back and forth as the flow goes. And then I'm going to throw in another kind of maybe metaphor, which is sometimes when somebody's pushing against you, pushing hard, the best answer is to let them in and, and to go with go with what they're saying and accept it as as whatever it is and then come back. Sometimes you have to let, sometimes instead of overcoming the pushing by pushing harder, you have to let go and let in. Um, and I think we don't often do that. We're, we're very often just trying to either block or push back. Um, and that, I don't know how to be articulate about, about what that means in dynamics, but I found that sometimes that really dissolves, <clears throat> dissolves uh, dilemmas when you let someone's assumption or assertion in. Um, Doug, is your hand up from before or did you want to jump back in the queue? Doug B. Uh, Doug Carmichael, you might have the last uh, last word on this call because we're, we're at time. Well, just to say my experience is that I used to think of coming to these Thursday mornings as going into something. I now think of them as time out from something. It's a big shift. Say more about that. Well, um, I don't want to ruin what I just said. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave it be. That's good. That's cool. And and that is a lovely, lovely uh, note to uh, to end the call on. So um, I thank you all. This has been a treat. Uh, we'll come back into these into these places. Uh, if you have suggestions for how to head back in, and in particular how to turn more turn better the soil that Grace opened up for us last week, uh, please say so, uh, and we'll go there because this is the important stuff that we have the possibility of doing something about. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.